good. Hi, everybody. I'm Norma Levy, president of New Plaza Cinema. Today, we look forward to a lively discussion about the 2002 documentary, The Kid Stays in the Picture. Uh, I now turn this over to our curator, Gary Palmucci. Gary? Well, thank you, Norma. Happy New Year, everyone. Um, this is the first time we're doing a documentary on the program. And while it may not qualify as a high art example of the form, uh, you can tune into Laurie Turchin's uh, documentary presentation this week for a cornucopia of that. Uh, I think it does portray a fascinating American life in a dense, almost tour de force uh, of nonfiction storytelling, which was really coming into its own in the early aughts. And I would say, if I had to make a choice, if you really pushed me to the wall, I would say, yes, Bob Evans is some kind of heroic figure in American film history. He personally resuscitated Paramount Pictures. Uh, they were in trouble back then in the, in the late 60s. They're, they're still in trouble now. Uh, and he urged Francis Coppola to put 45 minutes back into The Godfather, emphasis on urged. And he initiated what became another one of the real classics of world cinema, Roman Polanski's Chinatown. Now, Max, in the absence of any available trailer today, you had the idea of excerpting one of the key scenes in the doc, uh, apparently staged by Mike Nichols, no less, and a beautiful trailer in and of itself. Thank you, Gary, and Happy New Year, friends and followers of New Plaza Cinema Online. Yes, we're going to take a look at a section from The Kid Stays in the Picture. This is when Evans has been sent to the Gulf and Western headquarters in Manhattan uh, because the board is threatening to pull the plug on Paramount Pictures. It's not profitable. There's a chance to sell off a huge portion of the property to a very unsavory uh, overseas uh, conglomerate. And Evans has got convinced Nichols to direct him uh, doing a pitch to the Gulf and Western board as to as to why Paramount is worth uh, hanging in there for. Uh, so this is this would have come out in uh, in 1970 as he's discussing the 70 71 release schedule. So let's uh, let's take a look at uh, Robert Evans uh, doing his pitch to the Gulf and Western. Or this is the film that actually would have been shown to the Gulf and Western board. Good afternoon. My name is Robert Evans, and I'm Senior Vice President of Paramount Pictures. By the way, uh, this is this is not my office. We tried to shoot this scene in my office. Uh, we brought the cameras up, but there's one problem. My office was too small to get the cameras in. I came down to the studio to borrow a set from the young lawyers, and that's where we are now. As a matter of fact, I don't even have office at the studio anymore. Last year, packed up our gear, cut down our staff, tightened our belts, moved into small quarters at little offices in Beverly Hills. They're good enough for us, believe me. These uh, past few years have been rough for Hollywood. We've made a lot of mistakes. Some people have learned from them and some people haven't. We have. The money we spend is not gonna be through extravagances. The money we spend is gonna be on the screen. And speaking of the screen, I think, well, maybe that's the reason we're here today. I'd like to have the opportunity of showing you some of our product for 1971. But right now, we're approaching Christmas, and Paramount's Christmas gift to the world is love story. I could go on for an hour and tell you about 20 or 30 projects that are in various stages of development and bore you with it, so I won't. But I want to bring up one project, and that's The Godfather. I bring it up for several reasons. One, that it's starting production next month, Two, that it's going to be our next Christmas's picture. And three, to bring up the similarity between The Godfather and Love Story, which are the two biggest books of the last decade. Paramount owns them both. But Paramount has more than just owning them both. We didn't sit back in our plush chairs and write a check out for a million or a million and a half dollars for the books, which happens so often in our industry. We developed both of these books. If it weren't for Paramount, the book Love Story would never have been written. If it weren't for Paramount, The Godfather would never have been written because we were in there in the beginning, spurring the writers on, working closely with them to make these books the bestsellers that they are and what we think will be the great movies they're going to be. We at Paramount don't look at ourselves as 
passive backers of film. We look at ourselves as a creative force unto ourselves. And that is why Paramount is going to be Paramount in the industry in the 70s. I promise you that. So that was uh, that was shown to the Gulf and Western Board. And for those who've seen the documentary, it was a very effective way of uh, preventing the plug from being pulled. I was just thinking, watching this again, Max, we, of course, we don't have any Bob Evans's in the in the Hollywood film studio world today, although uh, there's one fellow who comes, comes kind of close and, and coincidentally right now he's been called kind of the savior of Hollywood films for having produced uh, uh, Spider-Man, which is setting all kinds of box office records. His name is Tom Rothman. I met him uh, oh. in, when we were both in our early 20s and occasionally our paths crossed uh, over the years. He was involved in the production of Titanic and a lot of other big films. And uh, he, he's kind of a somewhat larger than life character when he gets going. He's on television sometimes. He was on the Fox movie channel where he worked introducing some of their films. But as I, as I said, there are no Bob Evanses in the world today. And, and, and perhaps we're the poorer for it, but it's, of course, it's a very complicated uh, picture as they, I think, juggle a lot of balls skillfully in this doc. Well, it's what's interesting here is that when Evans got to Paramount in 1966, it was it was around the time that Gulf and Western took over the studio. So they became the first non entertainment related company to, to purchase outright a film studio. So you had this conglomeratization of Hollywood beginning, the corporatization of Hollywood was beginning, but at the same time you had this, this figurehead, uh, Robert Evans, who was this media savvy celebrity who gave a face to a studio at a time when that was falling out of fashion because uh, the old guard was changing. Well, cl clearly this guy, Charlie Bloodhorn, was a fascinating character in his own right. Oh Apparently there's no live action footage of him. I would think these filmmakers would have found it we just see him and all these with all these animated expressions on his face and he's and he's quoted and of course Mel Brooks years later in silent movie uh, spoofed the studio calling it engulf and devour rather than the Gulf and Western which Bloodhorn did up to a point until he, he was stopped by a fatal heart attack. Yeah, it was a somewhat uh, sinister trans transnational uh, that had a lot of investments in the Dominican Republic and so forth. But Bloodhorn or Bladorn uh, was a big movie fan and uh, he treated Paramount as kind of a toy train to uh, distract him from the other subsidiaries of this giant corporation. And there was a lot of investment in production in the 1960s, and I think that this, the film touches on some of the wrong projects, such as Paint Your Wagon, which was a Blue Dorn favorite. Oh, yeah. and, and meanwhile, Evans was trying to bring the studio more in line with changing audience tastes. The, the audience was getting younger and was wanting a little more than what the studios had been providing. Well, they hit it on the nose when we saw uh, uh, clips side by side of two Paramount films from 1969, Medium Cool, the, the Haskell Wexler uh, uh, film set in and around the uh, riots and other ex action at the 1968 Democratic Convention. And then we saw, you know, a giant musical number from Paint Your Wagon, which, uh, uh, I mean, neither of those films were, were, were particularly successful in their day. At least Medium Cool is considered some kind of a classic now. And ironically, in another one of our six degrees of new plaza cinema, the very first film I understand that Evans greenlit at the studio was one that you've occasionally excerpted with clips and we've talked about having on the program and I hope we will this year, The President's Analyst with, with James Coburn. That was uh, his first green light. So I had, see, here's the thing. I heard that one of the first was Alfie when Blue Dorn assigned him to the British to, to run the Paramount office in London. That, that was in the, uh, the Sam Wasson film, The Big Goodbye. Oh, really? Well, well, Alfie was released in 1966. So I want, right. and probably was shot in 65. So. You're right. So that, so that would be a little difficult. You're right. That, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense there. Even, well, even I, Evans couldn't, couldn't, you know, turn the clock back. I don't think no. uh, effectively single-handedly. <laughs> When you think of the, uh, I was just coming up with some titles that came out during when Evans was head of production. Now, he may not have greenlit all of these directly, but these were films. You mentioned Medium Cool, Gary. There was Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet. There was uh, Some of these films were not successful, like Martin Ritz, The Molly Maguires, but an inter interesting picture. Lindsay Anderson's yes. If. The Conformist was funded in Italy. I don't know how close uh, Evans was to that. Uh, there was a Goodbye Columbus. There was Visconti's The Stranger. Nichols directed Catch-22 right around the time he made that film that we just saw. 
There was the sterile cuckoo. There was uh, the parallax view. Uh, Serpico, Harold and Warren Wyatt. Beatty running uh, several times in this doc. I think that's I think that's a clip from the Paramount. And definitely. Sadly, many of these pictures you couldn't imagine a major studio making uh, today. Uh, that, that's another story. Absolutely. And, and the problem is uh, someone like Evans probably would have been too embarrassed to talk about films like Daisy Miller, which was a not successful, but to, but artistically, it's a, it's an outstanding film. But there, there were there were risks that were being taken there, as there were for a short few years uh, in other studios. Well, there's one line that I remember that can't, we can't allow to pass where we see uh, Bob Evans, rival, Frankie Blondes, who was, the, who was the head of theatrical sales at Paramount a couple of times in this doc. And he famously said to Peter Bogdanovich when after Daisy Miller had been completed and was being screened for the studio after after Bogdanovich had had three smash hits. And we're going to talk about him also uh, uh, soon. Uh, the last picture show, What's Up, Doc and Paper Moon. He said to Bogdanovich, well, what else can I say? Babe Ruth just bunted. That was, that was his reaction to, uh, to Daisy Miller. <laughs> <laughs> the anti-culture brigade. I, I think and we're going to talk more about, about this documentary. I mean, we, we get a sense of the sex, drugs, rock and roll side of Robert Evans. We don't get sen a sense of the, the boring side of his job, which is being on the phone all day, going to dailies, making editorial suggestions, reading scripts or treatments, which goes into that kind of position. Yeah. And apparently was much more hand on, hands on. Gary, I dug out an obscure interview from Sight and Sound uh, magazine from, it was a few months after The Godfather came out. They interviewed Coppola in the, uh, the autumn is, uh, issue. And Coppola was quoted as saying, well, he, you know, because he was not often, he was not one to give credit to Evans, you know. Yeah. But he said uh, he did credit Evans with defending the length of the film. Coppola said, I wanted to cut 15 minutes out. So th that's always been a dispute is wh what was the difference between the released version and the rough cut that was that Coppola presented? I, but, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if I buy that story completely as it's presented in the film. That was originally only 126 minutes. Yeah, I'm not minutes. buying that. No, no, but, I, I think. Yeah. And of course, the two of them had a very, very contentious uh, relationship on the Cotton Club. About a decade later, they wound up in court, as we see in the film. And then a yeah. couple of years ago at the New York Film Festival in 2019, uh, this revised version of the Cotton Club, Cotton Club Redux, was shown. I think it's a better <laughs> film than it was. And mm -hmm. Cop Coppola was there, having just turned 80 years old, and he, he was doing an interview on stage afterwards. And he says, well, you know, I see everything differently now than I used to. And I have to say this, it may sound sick, but we have to give Robert Evans some credit for his contributions artistically to, to the, you know, the finished version of the Cotton Club. So after all that, his, his, his influence and his, and his handiwork is still, is still present. And they don't mention in the film that apparently Evans was uh, Coppola, even though he had more control over The Godfather Part Two, he did uh, consult with Evans during the for the re-editing of that picture before it was released, because apparently it was having it was having issues. So That's it's right. hard to know who, who does what around here. But uh, yeah, the Cotton Club story, of course, is a is an explosive an explosive one in in and of itself. And. Uh, I thought this would be a good opportunity to bring Lori Turchin into the conversation. Lori is going to be three days from now giving a new Plaza online talk uh, that was rescheduled. We're very excited. It's filming reality, the history of documentary film. She's a film history professor. She has years of production experience. Uh, she's even squ apparently uh, squared off with the likes of Ridley Scott and uh, David Fincher, which I'll have to ask her about sometime. And Lori, uh, as a as a as a one who knows a great deal about documentary history, you were a big fan of Kids Stays in the Picture. What is it about this documentary or, or, or mockumentary or whatever, whatever classification it falls into that stands out for you? Well, I think first and foremost, it's different than what most people think a documentary will be. I think most people, when they think documentaries, don't think shiny and glossy. And this truly is one of those documentaries that I think is atypical and I think the other thing I love is that he was in charge of the studio at a time where the director was king, you know, the whole auteur theory. And I think he just harkens back to the time of the great studio boss where the producer was the auteur and not so much the director. But having said that, he also seems to be someone who as a producer was very hands-on and would respect 
if he respected the director, their choices um, to make during production. By the way, you mentioned um, uh, uh, the the uh, movie. Oh, what's the singing one? Well, uh, paint your wagon. Paint your wagon in the movie. I love it because he says it was a movie made for nobody. You know, he just like like just shoves it off. You know, and and even though he um, is quite an egoist, he does at times come back come out as a bit humble by some of the life experiences that he had um, as the head of Paramount and in the industry itself. And, and, we, and the scary part is what we're seeing here is a very, very sanitized look at Robert Evans's life. I mean, there's so much stuff they didn't get into or well, expand. Only one on. of his seven marriages is, is, is mentioned in the doc, I believe. It's, right. And, and the, the Cotton Club story is a lot nastier. He makes a reference to uh, his lawyer, Sidney Korchak, who was known as being a lawyer to the mob. You know, so there was some mob stuff going on there. And, and uh, it's a, you know, I mean, stories that in and of themselves could could make could make films. Uh, so, so Laurie, the, the documentary approach were they were they they were doing different techniques here than we normally would yeah. see for a documentary. Yeah, um, Brett Morgan and his partner Annette Burstein. If if you look at their body of work, it seems to be uh, uh, documentaries that they sort of cobble together from existing footage. And I think the thing about documentaries is that people are really so forgiving. You know, when we watch a feature film, you know, as purists, I need to see it on the big screen. I can't see it subtitled. And you know, as you learn in my documentary lecture on Wednesday, you know, people use anything literally anything to make a documentary these days and you know if you notice the some of the original footage that they have of his home it's they use it over and over and over again you know because they're really they just really went into the archives and you know i think it was the only chance that brett and nanette had to take over a little bit and put their imprint because you know, Evans being such a large figure, really just, you know, and plus he's a producer, he's going to want control, you know, I mean, it's the nature of the beast, so. And I know Dan Cale, who we're going to have on shortly, is going to talk about the visual, uh, more of the visual look of the film, but in the beginning, we hear the theme from The Great Gatsby, and that, that's that's a, a powerful uh, uh, reference to a, to a production that was one of Evans's greenlit productions in 1974. But scored the, the by Gatsby Nelson Riddle. Version. I'm sorry? Scored by Nelson Riddle in one of his rare uh, movie uh, scoring credits. Exactly. And so there's the, the Gatsby mansion as, uh, or, the, or the Evans mansion being channeled through the Gatsby theme. That was, that was fascinating. Someone else that he credits largely in the documentary who was a seminal figure in, in the industry was Peter Bart. You know, he kind of says, you know, Peter Bart could read six scripts in a weekend. It would take me six weeks to read one script, you know. So I think uh, who he, he who eventually became the editor in chief at Variety um, and has played a major role in the motion picture throughout his tenure. In Still it. churning out a column for one of the trades, I think Deadline. Uh, he and uh, yeah. Todd McCarthy, longtime veterans of Variety, are over there. Yeah. What's What's fascinating is that Bart came from a from a journalism background. New York Times. He had interviewed he had interviewed Evans. So to bring in a newspaper person to a Hollywood studio, that was considered a very strange and crazy decision that Evans did. But that does happen from time to time in Hollywood history. The, these moguls uh, turn to the more egghead types, the, the more the book readers to help inspire them for projects. It does happen. Well, again, Laura, what do you think of that? I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. What do you think of that famous quote that opens the film? And I'm, I'm sure you know it by heart. Uh, the quote is, there are three sides to every story, your side, my side, and the truth, and nobody's lying. And I think that just, that is documentaries in 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 three sentences, you know, um, it just, I, 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 I hearken back to my mother and father, and my dad would be telling a story, my mother would sit there and go, it never happened. You know, and my my father would be like, she doesn't know what she's talking about. We've all been there. <laughs> you know, so when you see when you read that, you know, memories serve each differently. I just think it, it it's rings true for every documentary and anything you see in life in general. You know, we all bring us to whatever we watch. So 
you know, you and I could watch the same movie. I could love it. You could hate it, you know? So there's always everyone's side to the story and nobody's lying. That's for sure. You know, when you watch, especially those who are innocents watching from the sidelines, when you see a movie like The Kid States in the picture, you say, oh, my God, get me away from these people in that industry. Oh, my God. But the set, the scary part is the post Evans era was worse in, uh, in from an artistic perspective, from a from a intellectual perspective, when you think that especially the regime that came in after he left, uh, we won't mention names, but feel free to, uh, yeah. we, we, which, which were consisted of former network television executives. And when you know what TV network programming was like in the 70s, that's pretty scary that men overseeing that were now making feature films without any regard to cinematic quality. They were just going for the money. And even Evans, uh, who cared about money, but there was something more he and other ex and, uh, and other producers of his era, I think, were, were going after. They were a little more than that. Occasionally, good pictures came out of Paramount, you know, after, after that period, like Days of Heaven, Atlantic City, Reds, but they were the exceptions. Yeah, there was a, there was the production designer, Richard Silbert, uh, was a production executive at Paramount following Evans for a while. And apparently he was responsible for some of the artier choices like 1900 and Polanski's The Tenant. But other than that, it was, yeah, there, there were these rarities, but other was that it was pretty much geared for the studios and Paramount really can be credited to this. They based, this is post Evans Paramount. They pretty much incorporated exploitation themes, themes that had worked for small distributors catering, catering to drive-in cinemas and grind houses. How can we take those themes and, and make lots of money with them and just boost the budgets a bit and more slash and gash and, and, and blood and uh, exploitation values. And that's that was one of the, the MOs. Not that I'm bitter or anything. I'll shut up. Now. Oh, the Friday the 13th Street. Uh, yes. Uh, Friday the 13th series rather came from them. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So it's, it's, it's a, there's a power, a powerful transition going on here. The set, to me, the ultimate tragedy, and this is Evan's own self-destruction, which we get a sense of in the film, is that he didn't, he was not able to translate whatever genius he had previously to his own work as, an, as a producer independently, because the, the work that he did independently was not on a par with some of the projects he had greenlit was he, when he was an executive. And that could be for a variety of reasons. Well, I think after the Cotton Club, you know, he was brought back several years later by Stanley Jaffe, whom he'd kind of gotten, gotten his start to, uh, producing in, uh, in Goodbye Columbus. Now, Stanley Jaffe was the son of Leo Jaffe, the head of uh, Columbia Pictures at that time for a number of years. But the films that Evans produced in the 90s were pretty much cookie cutter, a studio fair. He didn't have the clout, obviously, that he had. Uh, or probably uh, the money. Or, or, the, or the budgets or the, or the talent that flowed to him, uh, you know, in, in the 60s and 70s. And at that time, the, I mean, the studios are, are going to be gravitating by that time. This is the post blockbuster era. This is the, the, the focus group era, the marketing era. And it's not, it's not director driven projects the way it was in the, in the late sixties and early seventies. Of course, these productions, these great films, we, we do get a, a, a dose of, of reality. I think in the film we hear, you know, he, he, you know, fired Roman Polanski four times from Rosemary's Baby, and he fired Francis Coppola half a dozen times from The Godfather, or so he claims. That was part of the process, apparently, which is sounds far from smooth. So I'm glad you mentioned. Oh, go ahead, Laurie. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, I want to. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that, Gary, because in in that obscure interview I read from uh, Sight and Sound, which once again it's a few months, it's like six months after The Godfather comes out, mm. Coppola admitted in the interview he had been nearly fired twice. He didn't say four times. He said they wanted to fire me after the first day's footage. They they hated Brando, and then they they wanted to fire me because of the schedule. Uh, I I needed 80 days. They wanted to just give me 53 days. And Coppola said he had a meeting with Blue Dorn at Gulf and Western. It was a pleasant meeting. And Blue Dorn said, keep going, kid. And then he said, that's when I took control. So once again, we're weighing stories here. But this is closer to when the film came out. And he, he and, Cop and Coppola said, uh, while he defended Wev Evans releasing the longer version, uh, he still would have liked more control on The Godfather. Mm. Well, he called it the most unpleasant experience of his life in a piece in the New Yorker uh, not too many years ago. And I'm sure we're gonna hear about it all over again in a few months because the 50th anniversary of The Godfather is coming up in about uh, two months. And it's, it's going to be re-released, I was reading uh, this week. 
No, they, they tried reissuing it in 97 or something and it was a little, little it was a, it underperformed, but, but we're going to get back to all this, but I think the look of the kid that stays in the picture is worthy of going into. And this is a great opportunity to bring in Dan Cahill, our erstwhile conspirator in cinematic crime here at New Plaza Online. Dan is a, is a, is a, he's been in film production, he teaches filmmaking. And Dan, what can you share with us about the look of the kid stays in the picture and anything else that comes to mind? Well, hello, everybody, and Happy New Year to all. Um, I must begin by revealing an important fact here that the real reason why we chose the kid stays in the picture for our discussion today derives from the fact that we couldn't find a streaming service that would supply us with the film we really wanted to show, that being, of course, The Fiend Who Walked the West. But don't <laughs> give up. We'll keep looking. We'll be eternally vigilant, and we'll let you know as soon as it appears. Um, so I'm gonna switch over to my PowerPoint now and get it all framed up for you. Um, I wanna begin by observing that <clears throat> there are many, many, in fact, eight different styles of visuals in this documentary. And I won't elaborate all of them, of course, the most obvious one, it's a movie about movies, so we have a lot of film clips. Um, there's newsreel footage, home movies, TV interviews, but I wanna talk about some of the others that you don't typically find in documentaries. And this first one, there's a series here of moving footage, moving images, the camera gliding through woodland, which was Evan's home. I strongly suspect that all of this footage was filmed by John Bailey, who is the credited cinematographer who has an, a long and distinguished career. At one point, he was head of the Motion Picture Academy, so he's a well-known person. And the point I want to make about all these glimpses of Woodland, and they will come back, is that the mood and the tone of the photography explains what was going on in Evan's life. Clearly, this was at the peak of his, <clears throat> excuse me, at the peak of his career when he was top of the, top of the studios in Hollywood. Um, one other aspect of the visuals is stock footage. And this one is one that I really love. I, I suspect that the color was enhanced in post-production but I want that car. I love that color. It used to be called Cordovan, and it was just to describe leather in men's shoes, among other things. Um, what do you do when you have an empty hotel that you have to photograph? Well, you go to the pool, put the camera down really low, and glide along past all the empty beach chairs, a very striking shot that clearly pulls you into the film. And this has to be one of my favorite shots from the film, despite the fact that Stalag 17 and the Moon is Blue appeared in 1953 before the narrative of the film. It's just a strikingly colorful shot. Once again, I suspect that the colors were enhanced, but you kind of want to be there just for a few minutes at least. Here is another aspect of the film, which is animated shots. Now, this appears to be an original still of Evans sitting in a taxi and reading. The lighting on his head would suggest that that is accurate, but the background behind him is certainly not real. It's animated, it's blurry, it's kind of surreal, and it's lovely. I, these shots are not easy to do, by the way. And here is another example of one that is challenging. Putting together this multi-layered animation is not something that you simply just push a few buttons on your computer and it's there. This requires a lot of choreography of those shots, when they slide in, when they slide out. I counted, I think, four or five levels of images in this one shot. Now we're going to see Woodland at the peak, the pinnacle of Evan's career, when he was married to Ali McGraw, and everything was happy in his life. And now we're shooting the, the scenes in daytime. We see some of the female statuary on the grounds shot in beautiful light. Here we have the front door of the establishment with the rooster sculpture 
in the foreground. Not sure what the origin of that is. Maybe someone will know. Um, here is a shot we saw a little while ago of the living room and the, with the fireplace only by daylight. And we can now see how lush the grounds were in the background. And we know that somebody is probably planning a pool party at this gorgeous deep blue pool. You kind of want to be there, which is what this is all about, I think. Here's another shot welcoming you, in, welcoming you past the rooster sculpture into a nighttime party. More animation here. Um, once again, these are not easy to construct. This one used a spotlight to scan across multiple images of Evans. This was pretty much towards the pinnacle where he was a happily divorced bachelor again. You can see he looks pretty good in a pool. They put some gossip magazines designation of him on one side and you can see that the image is about to dissolve into another still photograph of Bob with a woman much, much too young for him. This is one frame from an animated sequence that basically tries to pictorially describe his drug world. And it's pretty good. Um, it's hard to show these things one still frame at a time, but this was kind of crazy stuff. Here is one more uh, from the time when his attorney called him to tell him he's about to get busted on a major drug possession charge. And maybe it was drug sales or purchase. I don't know, but he shouldn't have done it. And what we have here is, I presume, an actor, once again, photographed originally for this film, once facing, the, facing his back to the camera, sorry, talking on the phone to his attorney and walking, pacing the floor in a double exposure, carefully crafted by a master cinematographer. Here we see darkness at Woodland. Here is yet another female statue, but mostly in shadow, very noir, very much a troubled time for him. And the last of the shots from this film is leaves blowing across an empty courtyard. And this one struck me because it's clearly homage to a shot from, oh, a movie we talked about here six weeks ago that he distributed, possibly helped to finance at Paramount, that being, yes, folks, The Conformist with dead leaves blowing across an empty courtyard. So that is all I have to show you. I do want to give a little credit to one other medium here, which most of us know now as the Ken Burns technique. And this movie came out, oh, I'd say about 10 to 15 years after Burns' career began. And we all know that in the original Burns technique, the camera would glide slowly in a very measured pace over a still frame and sometimes zoom back to reveal what all the elements in the still were. But Morgan and Burstein were doing Ken Burns on steroids. Their camera just zips around in those frames. And it may be a sign that the pace of an audience's attention span had really increased rapidly. Although I've just been watching Mr. Burns, one of his latest documentaries on country music, and boy, it's just as slow paced as all the others were. So I don't He's know. never going to change. Yeah. With all due respect to Ken Burns. I love Ken Burns, um, but he definitely, like, I, I come from a commercial background. I shot a lot of TV commercials. So for me, like 60 seconds and I'm done, you know? <laughs> I'm totally one of those people who's guilty of having a short attention span. And I'm just like, Ken, Ken, we could do it so much quicker. <laughs> Come on, Ken. Come on, pick it up, boy. <laughs> now, I think How we know, we uh, Daniel, that John Bailey was a big fan of The Conformist too, right? So that, that may, he may have had that idea himself. The, uh, easily, easily. Yeah. Max, I think Max, you have to unmute. You're muted. <laughs> there we go. Sorry, kids. Dan, I'm assuming the shots that you showed us, those beautiful shots of the mansion, those were, were those photographed in 35 millimeter. They have a, so they certainly have a, I saw it originally projected in 35 and it, certainly looked like the real deal yeah. to me. Yeah, I mean, when you hire John Bailey, you're not gonna give him a, a handy cam, you know, he's, mm. gonna, he's gonna do it properly. 
this was released in 2002. So um, I, digital wasn't really, you know, was that, was, that was the, the early, early, early days of digital theatrical projection. Very, very early, not really used at all like it is now for sure. Um, and and the uh, the irony here it was it was released by USA Films, which had been a result of Gramercy Pictures being merged with Polygram by Barry <laughs> Diller, who, <laughs> who is of course. Uh, I can fill in some of the blanks here. Evans once told a story that when Diller joined Paramount, this was a few months before Godfather 2 came out, October 74, something like that. And Evans said, uh, oh, it, it's it's really exciting. I'm really, I really look forward to, to working with you, Barry. And Diller's response was, listen to me, you're not working with me, you're working for me. You know, And that, that kind of gave us a sense of where things were heading. Uh, that summer, I believe it was Time Magazine it had a cover story on The Great Gatsby called The Great Gatsby Supercell. And there was a big interview with, with some of the men, people you mentioned, uh, Frankie Blondes, and, and then also, also R R Robert Evans was interviewed. And that did not sit well with the New York office of Gulf and Western. I guess Martin Davis and others were felt very threatened by all that attention going to Evans and company. And that seems to have started kind of the cracks in the foundation. Yeah, and in that summer's Time Magazine, I remember a cover a cover story, uh, Jack Nicholson, the star with the killer smile. We know, we know what, that, what that film was. Uh, yes. That reference to. For, for Chinatown. And, you know, once again, the problems with all these things, and, and Gary, the other day, you had a great term for, for uh, Evans. You called him a credit hog. Were you, was, that, was that you, Gary? Yes. Yeah. I, I wouldn't be the first to use that term. But. You know, and, and he and... Uh, yeah, he and Peter Bart and others were famous as, for taking full credit over how The Godfather turned out. I remember an interview, maybe in the late seventies, with James Caan, he's and you know who's who never held back, and he said, "What can I say? The studio thought it was crap, and then after it was a hit, everybody was taking credit for it." Right. So it's it's always hard to know who was responsible for what here, uh, but from uh, from the Sam Lawson book the big goodbye it, it is compelling when they talk about the the final stages of Chinatown when the film is being edited Roman Polanski was absent from that process he turned in a cut and then he left and apparently trusted Evans with deciding on what the ultimate music score was going to be which was Jerry Goldsmith's score so that was a case where Evans didn't Polanski, have a kind of Polanski went over to Europe he was he was uh, directing an opera and apparently he had a, a fellow Pole composer whose name escapes me, who also suffered a tragic accident. Oh, Christoph Kamita. Christoph Kamita. Yes. And nobody liked that score. And, and I think Evans and others uh, connected with the film got Jerry Goldsmith in very quickly to compose what was that immortal trumpet theme for Chinatown that we hear over the... Uh, I'm, I'm leading to confusion. Please forgive me. Uh, Christoph Kamita had died in the late 60s. He had, he had scored Rosemary's Baby. There was, was another... Composer. Right. Th there was another composer who, who did a Chinatown score, which is now available. And it's a very creepy, frightening score, out of step with, I think, the theme of the movie. I could see why they felt it was too much. Uh, but it's a, it's a wonderful, brilliant score. And it's now on CD. These alternate scores can be fascinating, like the alternate to Hitchcock's Torn Curtain. I think that was released at some point. It is. And, and uh, the, so, so I would say, even though the, 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 the kid stays in the picture, it's designed to be a Robert Evans puff piece and a propaganda piece. I think it did ultimately set, sell him a bit short in terms of getting more of a sense of some of the other important works he supported. And uh, yeah, there was a lot of bad behavior going on, but also there was a lot of passion for getting some unusual projects made. Well, that was one of the other things that I liked, and this is just the storyteller in me, is that he starts by getting this serendipitous role as Irving Thalberg, who is one of the, you know, if you don't know who he is, Google him. He was the child genius um, at, at, you know, running the studio. And there he becomes, a studio boss eventually, you know, so it's sort of this full circle moment. And, you know, I love, you know, I think one of the other quotes besides the one at the beginning is luck is when opportunity meets preparation, you know, I think yeah. is, is one of the great lines in that movie. And it's one that I think applies to everything in life, but especially filmmaking, you know, 
Right place, right time. Right place, right time. I thought it was also very revealing that Evans stated that his hero that he most wanted to emulate was Daryl Zanuck, a name which has come up frequently in our discussion. Another Six today. Degrees character on this program. Yeah, uh, a man who was clearly responsible for a lot of brilliant films out of Fox. So we can't complain about that. He picked a good role model. And very hands-on. The, the one element that the, that the kid stays in the picture shortchanges in terms of Evan's acting career. Yes, there was the fiend that walks the, who walks the West, but he also was in uh, John Mugulesco's uh, the, the Best of Everything with Joan Crawford. He played a cad, uh, which is a perfectly respectable film, and he's appropriate. I, I have seen that in a cinema. Yeah, so so it's too bad. They, you know, they, I don't know why they, they uh, didn't include that, but there was a little bit more, and that certainly was at the tail end of his screen acting work before he made the transition. Uh, yeah. One other interesting little tangential thing. Um, night before last, my ubiquitous partner Janet and I were trying to decide what to watch, what kind of movie to watch, and I voted for this one because I thought, well, on Sunday I'm going to be in Hollywood producer land. Let me see if this triggers anything. Uh, I'd seen it several times before, of course, but uh, I even went and did as much research as I could on this guy. And I, the only reference I could find in indexes to Robert Evans was to their making Popeye together. That's right. But nobody seemed to acknowledge that Evans was an inspiration for Griffin Mill, the protagonist in The Player. And Robert Just Alton was very, very reluctant to make Popeye with Evans. I remember him saying at the time, he said, well, I don't like I don't like the kind of pictures he makes and I don't like the kind of publicity that he's associated with. But apparently they got together because both of them had severe back problems, which Evans, as we know, solved in a particular way. And uh, <laughs> Altman needed some help. Evans sent him to his doctor and, 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 Altman, and Altman was markedly improved. So Evans said, Bob, you owe me a picture. And that, that was what I got <laughs> That's that was so the official fun. story. Yeah, <laughs> official story, exactly. And you know, it also the fact that Stanley Jaffe so many years later is there to rescue me. I think it's just, it's such a showbiz story because I try to explain to my students that it's about this, it's about networking. It's not about, you know, and, and it's, it's about being nice to the people you meet on the way up because you're going to meet them on the way down and if you're not nice to them they're not going to remember you so you know the, the the idea of paying it forward um as much as an egoist as he was he still seems to have had some moniker of decency in him you know because when you think about other executives of the era, I mean, you don't you don't hear the the terror filled anecdotes about working with Robert Evans as you did those who had to work with James Aubrey at MGM in the early seventies. Yeah. It was an absolute terror, taking people's films away and butchering them, and so worst forth. Worst of the worst. <clears throat> the worst of the worst. So uh, th there were, there, as you as you indicated, Laurie. I mean, there there were conflicts, but ultimately he seemed to respect what the director could do, which was more than what subsequent administrations uh, achieved you know and uh, we're at a point where we can we can be ready to take questions and thoughts from the audience just a reminder that laurie will be back with us on on wednesday for her filming reality the history of doc documentary film which is three o'clock and East Coast time. Sean will have more information for us on that. And then I, on Tuesday, a day before Laurie, I have my film craft is resuming. We're going to talk about film editing, which is a big point with Robert Evans. And then at the end of the month, uh, I will be doing something on, and this seems like a strange topic to, to include in a Robert Evans event. I'm talking about comedy teams and slapstick. But when you see this trailer, it's not as far removed from our discussion today as you may think. Uh, this is gonna be uh, a couple of weeks after Laurie gives her talk. This is gonna be on the 26th. I'll be doing a presentation on comedy teams and this will give you a, a sense of what uh, we have coming up. Now, appropriately enough, that very last clip from The Odd Couple was a Robert Evans greenlit project. So, and that was a that was one of the second film by 
uh, we don't associate them as a uh, comedy team, the Lemon and Matthau. And then we saw Jerry Lewis briefly. Well, Jerry Lewis was exiting Paramount about a year before or shortly before Robert Evans got there. Jerry Lewis was the old Paramount. Evans was the new Paramount. So that's going to be on the 26th. And right, right. now, um, uh, Marianne, you can assist us with our uh, guests. Can you, I, I, first of all, it was illuminating. Thank you very much. And I forgot to tell you, to make you very jealous that I am in Mustique and it is 85 degrees today. <laughs> However, <laughs> thanks for not for rubbing it in. We appreciate that. <laughs> It's time for question. And so um, I just would like to remind you that if you have a question, you go down at, in reaction and you raise your hand. But we have someone who has made a lot of comment and I would like, I would like to invite Bess to join you guys because she knows a lot about documentary. Bess, would you join us? Uh, um, I'll join you audio, Lee, but <laughs> I prefer not to have my camera on if that's okay. Totally fine. So tell us how you know so much about uh, Bob Evans. Oh, I'm just, uh, I'm a film buff, grew up in LA. Um, just, you know, bitten by the movie bug at a, at a very young age. And, um, you know, when, when you like something, you try to research it. Very good. Thank you. One thing that I that I did mention in the comments that I had forgotten about because it's been a while since I got that We don't hear you anymore. You losing you, your audio. You did oh, I'm sorry. Is this better? Much yeah. better. Yeah. Is that um I was in I, I it, it occurred to me the similarity between the open We're losing you again. We are losing you again. Uh, Okay, <laughs> I'm so sorry. The opening montage of Citizen Kane and the opening montage of The Kid Stays in the Picture. And I, I just didn't know if people discussed that uh, correlation. Now that you mention it, it, there, it, does, it is reminiscent of that gradual descent into Xanadu and Citizen Kane. That's very, that's fascinating. And I also personally was reminded of the beginning of Rebecca. Last night I dreamed I went to Manderley again. Now, of course, the building they were showing had been burned down, but it was still a similar thing about using luxury real estate to draw you into a narrative. Yeah. Oh, and the other comment I had made was the use of um, animation. And of course, the attention that the documentary Flea is getting because in part, are using animation in a documentary. I, I thought that was interesting also. So, so there, was, there was a comment about the use of the animation in the documentary? Yes, and the, the documentary- Because we're, we're having trouble hearing you, Beth, sorry. Okay. Beth has one of my phones. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the documentary Flea. The documentary Flea that came out. Lee? The documentary Flea, which is a new release. Yes, a, a, Dan, a Danish film. <clears throat> That's because it used animation within the documentary format. In, in documentaries, a lot of time you'll see animation in lieu of actually having present footage that they shot or stock footage or historical footage. So animation is a nice way to to fill in where you don't have stuff. There's, there's a filmmaker, I forget his name, but you guys may have read about this, which has this very ambitious plan to reconstruct uh, Orson Welles' magnificent Ambersons by animating all the missing uh, footage in the film. There's about 30 minutes that was cut. The script exists, the continuity, all that stuff. And he's, he's been attempting for several years now to create a version, uh, you know, interpolating animated footage. We'll see if that ever sees the light of day. Wow. Um, uh, the filmmakers of The Kid Stays in the Picture did the Chicago, it wasn't the movie that was just out, it was earlier than that. And it was Chicago 10, yeah. Chicago 10, yeah. And it was done with animation, but that kind of animation where it looks like a real per person that they turned into an animation, you know, so. And it's, we see these, it's this era, 
and the kid stays in the picture as part of that era. And I, I think we have to give Errol Morris credit for this, uh, bringing fancy, uh, prof polished, professional, I mean, professional Hollywood style of cinematography to documentary subjects in the late 80s, starting with a lot of his stuff. I think that was an influence that is still being felt today by yeah. those who want to do a little more than just set a camera in front of somebody. The Thin Blue Line, that was a seminal blue concert line. in that regard. Exactly. Thank you, Bess. Thank you, Beth. Okay, we have no more question. I think you covered it all. Uh, and so I would like then- uh, Mary Marianne, Marianne, we yeah. do have four hands raised. Oh, I don't see them, wow. Yeah. So, so I'll- yeah, can you take them because I don't I see them here. I will. Okay. Kathleen, do you wanna do you wanna unmute yourself and turn on your camera? Hello. Hello. Nice to see everybody. Uh, and just so as you know, that's Basel, Switzerland in the background there. Um, <laughs> so it's a little bit late on my end. Uh, um, I was. I have two questions. Um, first of all, it was an interesting, really interesting um, movie to watch, but I don't know that I would have called it a documentary, and I'm not a technical expert, I haven't taken Laurie's course yet, um, and I kind of thought that a documentary was to be more objective. Um, this, this seemed more like a video memoir, and very subjective, very from the first person point of view of Robert Evans, and so I was just curious to know why we consider this a documentary. That's my first question. Um, here's the thing, the term, you know, the definition of a documentary, I think is something that we all grapple with, especially now, because there's so many types of documentaries out there. But I think it falls under documentary because everything that was shown is based in reality. It's clips. Um, there, this is not a fictionalized story of his life, certainly. Um, you can't have any documentary that doesn't have some kind of opinion. Um, this one was a little more opinionated than others. Um, and because of the subject matter um, came across as being rather, you know, verbose, if you will. Um, okay, thanks. My second question, and, and maybe, maybe Daniel, you filled in some of my, my curiosity. Uh, I, I, I thought, from my point of view, that there was a lot of archival photos and videos and, and the like, which made it really, really interesting. And, and I wondered whether or not that was typical of somebody in his role to have had his life so videotaped or whether or not because his ego was so big, did he, did he have it arranged where there would be so much of him videotaped or photographed or what? Now, I didn't actually pick up when I was watching it that that some of it was animated so um which i don't know whether that means that it was sort of like filled in which seems to me a little bit of cheating on the documentary side again i'm not a technician but anyway well, i think i think morgan and, and burstein wanted us to be more as interested in the visuals of the film as we possibly could be and you do kind of reach a saturation level where you've seen so many Ken Burns shots and so many new, so much newsreel footage that it livens it up to see them doing something different with the footage. Um, I would also have to say with regard to how much footage there was of Robert Evans, I think we all know he had at least one or two publicists working for him all the time, getting mm -hmm. cameras shooting him when he wanted to be shot. So. I'm sure they had no trouble finding a lot of, of stuff of him in public. Um, I, yeah, I don't think it was a challenge to find footage of this very public figure whom a lot of people in America knew when they didn't really know any other producers' names. Right. That's a double that's list. Oh, go curious. Ahead. Sorry, sorry, Max, I, I'm no. sorry. I was say that's why I was so curious because it seemed like there was so much and I was just curious as to whether that was because he was who he was. What were you gonna say, Max? No, I was just gonna, and these are great questions. Uh, it was just, it's the double-edged sword where you're an executive, you wanna promote yourself, you wanna be a celebrity, the media loves you, they're interviewing you, they're photographing you. 
including when you're when you're when you're going downhill and you're in, uh, involved in scandal then there so it's that's where the, that's where the celebrity continues and that's there was so much documentation of this man's public public uh, personality he also dated a lot of very public females i mean you know he was married to phyllis george um uh catherine mm -hmm. oxenberg he was married to so he was out for, in for the, 10 for 10 days i believe uh, yeah 10 days, it got 10 days. so that was a serious relationship for him i'm glad to hear that yeah. and let's not forget him escorting henry kissinger okay so <laughs> yeah i dated henry kissinger <laughs> That's great. Thanks a lot. Yeah, you know, it's this, uh, which which brings I don't know. I I, I promised I was gonna add, I was gonna make an uncomfortable comment today. In watching this piece, I see uh, there's a lot of a Trump character emerging from him. If 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 because you know right down to the Henry Kissinger Association to these public scandals to this, you know, if 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 uh, Trump didn't have the didn't have the creative genius and the good taste in filmmaking. But there's but I think, unfortunately, that seems to emerge in his personality more towards the end. That's just a, a theory. Um, I don't you know, here's the thing, though, he in in deference to him, he admits he's wrong at times, you know, like when it comes to his marriage. Uh, with Ali McGraw, right. he blames it all on himself. But El Paso was it was oh, only and, an hour um, and forty minutes away by plane. Right. He, he, right. he never he never yeah. went. So he took you know there were times throughout the documentary you know like his drug bust and when his son said, "Daddy, I'm so proud of you." You know, so um, there's a bit a little he, he shows you just enough humanity to hook you, you know, and and into believing he's a good guy, and in that. Yeah. In that way, I would say he's different. You can you can see from the film clip that we showed where he's pitching to the Gulf and Western board, you can see the charisma of, of him at his height, how charis how charismatic and seductive a personality he is. That really came out in that in that footage. Yeah, I kept the, I am back. We <laughs> had, thank you, Kathleen. It's so nice to see you. Thank you. Happy New Year. Thank you. Nice to see you all too. Marjorie, could you come now? Please, Marjorie, okay. can you hear me? Yes, but yeah. we don't see you yet. No, I, I, I look a mess. I had a bad day, <laughs> so I'll leave it off. Anyway, I just had one question, like where he says he really helped Mario Puzo develop The Godfather. Was that true? I mean, the book, I mean, not the movie, the book. And, and the love story. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I know, he said them both, but I mean, the way I heard about The Godfather was uh, Mario Puzo just needed money and he just wrote a crime drama drama because he thought that it would, um, you know, sell better and it all it became a hit. So I didn't know any of this about, um, you know, him helping him write it. So I just wondered if that was true. Well, it's in, in terms of once again, we don't know if he actually participated in writing. It could be that uh, that Peter Bard and others were involved in helping develop the novel, uh, and he going back and that, forth. And he doesn't say he wrote it. He says he helped develop it. So Paramount. How, how do you develop a novel without helping writing it? Maybe Paramount owned the publishing company and then he had a hand in it. But I, I find that one of his least credible statements. In this. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. That's that's all I wanted to know. <laughs> all I wanted to know. Thank you. Especially when he said that. he couldn't read even Marjorie. read a book in six weeks. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Barry, Thank you. Barry, please. Can you uh yes, hi. Hi, Barry. Barry. Barry, another terrific presentation. Really, really interesting. You picked a great great uh, film, a great documentary. Um, it's really interesting how Woodlands plays in this uh, documentary. It plays like another character. Uh, he, he constantly goes back to it and it has a really interesting history. Um, even today it's owned by, again by an industry executive. It's owned by David Zaslav, the CEO of Discovery. And over the last couple of years, he has petitioned the Historic Commission in Beverly Hills to restore it and it's going through uh, hoops and, and other issues, but they film so much and that this is the actual house. How do they have access to it? Was it between owners? 
Uh, Lori, do you know who owned it at the time? Don't know, but if it was abandoned. Well, I think this would have been in 2002. Now, Evans got the house back with Jack Nicholson's help around 1994, I believe, from, from some articles I was reading before we went on. So I think he was back in there at that time in 2002, and he, and he was there till his death. You know, he paid 290000 Barry, for the house in 1960, whatever. It sold to your friend there for $16 million. Uh, exactly. You know. Exactly. <laughs> And according to the Sam Wasson book, Paramount, as soon as as soon as soon Evans acquired it or took control of it in the 60s, Paramount invested a million dollars. This is at the time in, in, the, in, in the house. Because Blue Dorn wanted a place where they could work and play. So Gary, is it? are you saying that he owned it at the time of the filming? Obviously yeah, they was, this, was, this was filmed like probably 2000, 2000 2001, and he'd had, it, he'd had it back thanks to Jack Nicholson for several years already at that point. He had lost it in the early 90s. So they could dress it as a, 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 um, an empty house and they could use it as a, uh, a completed house. They had that access at the time. Yeah. And yeah, as you think, mentioned, think. It, al it almost has a character of, you know, place it itself. Oh, uh, it really does. I mean, it really, it, it's an impact on his life, but it's also important in the story. And, and he doesn't even go into what took place there, the numbers of people that uh, crossed the threshold into that house. Every Hollywood uh, star and, and every Hollywood executive was in that house. And, and, we, a, and we only see in the distance, uh, Barry, that cabana where apparently he screened the dailies, you know, for Chinatown and various other Paramount classics. And apparently he had a 16 foot movie screen. Uh, it was one of the widest screens in a, in a private residence of the area. We know, we know that that's why. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Great thank job. You, Barry. Thank you, Barry. Barry. And uh, our last uh, question will come from IR. IR, can you unmute? Hello there. Oh, yes, now thank I you. Oh, yes. Excellent. And in, in uh, relating back to Kathleen, who opened up the questions, this is you're seeing a visual of me in a dark room at midnight. Uh, just, <laughs> as as well as as well as the idea that uh, a, a memoir could very easily, uh, or, or, or almost always, is a doc documentary you know it is just by nature when you put it on screen a memoir become is a, a part of it is a uh, type of documentary it seems to me <clears throat> i was wondering whether you lovely people thanks again for a lovely uh, another excellent presentation whether each of you insider people would like to tell a story about robert evans that was not in this memoir or documentary Sorry, I gotta go. I can't stay. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> it's all yours. I'll let you others go first. I think I've exhausted all my good Bob Evans quotes here in the course of the program. Yeah, I don't have any. I mean, you know, it's there was a there was a story that Interview Magazine interviewed Lynette McKee at the time Round Midnight came out. And that was a film that we talked about last year. We talked about jazz and blues and film. And she, of course, was in the Cotton Club. And the interviewer was asking her about the production. And, and she defended Coppola. She, she actually was very critical of Evans. Uh, she felt that Evans was... Uh, he was upset, this is according to her, that Coppola was not giving enough attention to the Caucasian characters in the story. And uh, she defended Coppola in that case, trying to trying to make it more of a story about the African American characters. So uh, that was a uh, that was one ask, that was one story that I that I had heard that Lynette McKee had shared in an interview, an unusually candid interview. You don't often hear uh, or read about in, in magazines. And, and, if you time. haven't seen it, this Cotton Club Redux. You should go back and and, and I know it's been re released on various formats. I think there is a lot more time given to the story. Uh, of, of the African-American characters and the behind the scenes of the Cotton Club and the Heinz brothers, et cetera. Despite, I will come back to that thing that Coppola said at the New York Film Festival. He says, well, it's, he said, literally, this may sound kind of sick, but we have to give Bob Evans you know, more credit than perhaps he's gotten for the, you know. And I, I have another story too, uh, the Cotton Club story. While it was in production, I, I heard this in Los Angeles, during production, things got so bad that Coppola sent Evans a note. You will not see this film until it's in the theaters. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. 
Thank you. And now th there is Nina. Nina raised her hand. Nina, can you unmute and? Uh... Yeah. Um, it made me, Bob Evans made me think of Neil Gabler's book, An Empire of Their Own, because he comes from a family of, from Seventh Avenue man garment manufacturers, and that a lot of the movie moguls from the old studio days, uh, early on, even much earlier in the industry, did come from the garment industry, didn't they? Isn't there a tradition? Samuel Baldwin used it, to sell love. It was an opportunity for Jews to have an empire of their own. And uh, I, I just sort of connected Evans because his family uh, was very successful on 7th Avenue. And that it's almost like in the tradition of Jewish uh, movie moguls who, do, who did have that origin on 7th Avenue. I mean, I don't know if I'm up off base on that, but- not, not really. I, I wish they had given, I, it's because Nina, you remind me, I, I wish they had just filled in a little more data on that because he's suddenly, he's, he's doing the design thing, then he's doing the acting thing. According to the Sam Wasson book, the, well, he grew up at a 110 Riverside Drive on the Upper West Side. His father, who was a frustrated concert pianist, uh, was actually a dentist who had an office on the corner of 133rd and Lenox Avenue in Harlem. So how that led to Evans getting into the garment trade, that, that I'm not clear on. But, but He actually, in his youth, he did some voiceover work. He did a little bit of acting and stuff in, in, when he was very young. And, you know, even at the beginning, he says, you know, I used to be I used to be in women's clothing. In other words, I used to be in women's pants. And he makes that joke. You know, he couldn't resist. He couldn't resist yeah. that. And he, <laughs> and he does that a couple of times in the movie where he talks about something and says, you know, um, things like that. So um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, his family's company was very well known and well established. Yes. Evan Picone, my sure. ex-husband, did work uh, in, in construction on their offices. Oh. And they, they were a very big time operation. Yeah, they were a high end line. So it just sort of brought back to, to mind how Neil Gabler's book on an empire of their own about J Jews from who who often were in that line of work uh, before they be went to Hollywood and became moguls. It's definitely an old school narrative as opposed to, uh, let's say, a former agent or a, an attorney who becomes a ex studio executive, which became the narrative in by the 70s and 80s. His That's is definitely answer. that Hollywood story, you know, where he's sitting at the counter at Schwab's and, you know, the, the they see him from across the room, you know, and and, you know, and, Zan you know, Zanuck tells him you're going to be in the kids, you know, in uh, the Ernest Hemingway movie and you know, he just, it's just who he is, you know. Thank you, Nina. Uh, Sean, please, now it's your turn to take the lead. <laughs> Bye, okay. everybody. <laughs> okay, you guys, you, that was, it's, it's just amazing how much we can think to talk, come up with to talk about just about anything. So that was, that was fun. It was fun. I'm, I'm hoping it was fun for everyone. I just want to remind everyone of some things that are coming up in the next several weeks. Um, Tuesday, uh, Max did mention uh, he's got a film craft uh, session on the film editor. And um, I think it's going to be a really good one. We've had several people sign up already. So I think I'm looking forward to that. And then on Wednesday, Lori didn't have a voice last Wednesday, so we needed to uh, move her lecture to this coming Wednesday. So I think if you haven't already signed up for that and you want to learn more about the history of documentary film uh, from an expert, I think it would be great. And that's uh, Filming Reality, the History of Documentary Film. And then on on uh, Wednesday, the 26th, Max, great trailer, uh, loved it, or your uh, intro on uh, um, legendary comedy teams. And we all could use a little bit uplifting time, I think. Uh, and then on the, the 30th, Sunday, we're doing the film Groundhog Day. And thanks to Dan Cahill, we have um, Violet Ramis, um, Harold Ramis's daughter, is going to be joining us for that discussion. And so Groundhog Day is a fun movie. We've probably all seen it once, if not twice, but it's, it's one of those that's just fun um, and uplifting. And, and it'll be great to talk to um, uh, Violet about her father and and his background in making that movie. So thanks everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us.
It's always great to see everyone. Happy New Year, everyone. Thank Happy you. Happy New Year, everyone. Thank you, Sean. Right. Happy New Year. See you next time. Thank you.